Hello, this is Jeffrey Williams with Too Late for the Gods. S.J. Thomason recently debated Snake was right on the existence of God-given moral laws and duties on the, on the Modern Day Debate channel, which I've linked to below. S.J. had previously agreed to debate me on this topic, but backed out, so I'll respond here. As I usually do, I'll just focus on her opening statement and not on the debate itself. If, S if SJ thinks I've misrepresented her in any way or wishes to respond, I'll repeat that I am always available to debate or discuss this. SJ is typical of Christian apologists. She espouses a narrative that is often in conflict with reality and clings to it for her own psychological reasons. It's a way of justifying her own troubles with the world. Her defense of the narrative is reflexive and brittle, and her method is to piece together bits and pieces from various writers and authorities and venture into fields in which she has absolutely no understanding, such as philosophy or physics, armed with no more than a patchwork of poorly understood and incoherent quotes. The result is inevitably fallacy and claims of facts, not in evidence. We'll trace the elements of her narrative and the fallacies and false claims used to defend it by examining her opening statement in detail. She starts with a definition of objective moral laws and duties. Okay, so the big question today, we're gonna to talk about what are objective moral values and duties, and then we're gonna talk about grounding. So we believe that objective morals, uh, values exist and they're stance independent, which means that the values of truth, justice, equity, liberty, equality of opportunities are stance independent. They don't vary as a function of anyone's opinion. And that refers to what's good or bad. It's in a descriptive sense. And then we have this idea of objective moral duties and examples of that include following the golden rule, caring for your fellow humans and the value of life. And you know, we have values of life, liberty and justice, and we have these duties to follow these particular values. So we have a moral duty, for example, for care. And people like Jonathan Haidt and others have found that in a lot of big studies that have determined that they've looked at a number of different humans and they realize we have these certain foundations upon which or from which we draw when we're making decisions about what to do and what not to do in life. The big question I'm going to look at is more of an ontological perspective today. So I'm going to look at whether or not these exist and what their grounding is. So we also have evidence that uh, they're universal. We've got evidence that these values that I just mentioned and duties uh, from studies of the UN, major world religions, global surveys by authors like Kinnear and Schwartz and the Globe Studies and the World Value Surveys have essentially identified these same universal moral values and duties. So the question is, well, are they also objective, meaning uh, meaning we know that they're universal across the globe today, but if they're objective, we should be able to find that they stood uh, stance alone through the centuries. And so we find whether or not we have that. And so I would say they are transcendent to cultures, eras, and ethnic groups. We have evidence of that in places like the Declaration of Independence, where we said we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equally, we're endowed by our creator, and we come to discover these over time. And so that's the way that our cultures have existed through the centuries. We have been moving closer and closer to God's ideal. And so I'm also saying that they're grounded in God, which means they're not mere abstract conceptualizations. She begins with the claim that there are objective moral laws and duties that we receive from a transcendent God. This is the major claim she needs to prove, and throughout we will trace her efforts to do so. In this part of the opening, she foreshadows what will prevent her from succeeding. Objective laws would, by definition, be external to the human subject and immutable. Otherwise, they would derive subjectively and be, rel be relative to circumstance. To no one's surprise, she gets in trouble in the very first bullet point by listing moral values that she claims to be stance independent, such as justice, equity, liberty, equality of opportunity. The idea of justice, however, is notoriously flexible and has changed dramatically over time. It is impossible to find an objective standard of justice throughout history. Equity and liberty were not always valued, but became prominent after the Enlightenment. 
It is a devastating fact that if these were in fact objective and immutable moral values, we would need to reject the Bible as a guide. She herself acknowledges that to show that these values are not just universal but objective, she would have to show them unchanged over time. Her every example, however, will demonstrate just the opposite. She tries to evade that fact by claiming that over time we have become closer to God's idea, but this change over time increasingly conflicts with the laws of the Bible, a dilemma she never resolves. She then quotes from the Globe study as evidence for objective moral values by conflating universal with objective. That most cultures have similarities in their values only establishes that there is probably a common factor among all people from which our moral stances derive. Universal, however, does not mean objective and can usually better be explained by common brain structures and, in, and innate drives. We have evidence that such innate capacities exist. We have no evidence of an external lawgiver. In the final point, she misuses the word transcendent in order to slip into an unjustified claim when she says, these moral values are transcendent to cultures, eras, and ethnic groups, which we have come to discover over time. Thus, they are objective. They are grounded in God, which means they aren't mere abstract conceptualizations. Transcendent refers to something beyond our physical world, the metaphysical, yet she refers to traits observable in this world. The correct word would be common, not transcendent, and there is nothing in commonality that proves objectivity, negating her conclusion of thus they are objective. All people have a sense of beauty, but not all agree on what beauty is because while we all have an innate sense of beauty, there is no objective standard and the idea of beauty varies greatly over cultures and over time. The same can be said of morality. She then repeats her initial claim that moral values are grounded in God and not mere abstract conceptualizations as her conclusion. I'm sure most can see, however, that that conclusion rests solely on her equivocation between transcendent and universal. She failed to prove either condition of her claim, that moral laws are immutable and that God is the giver of this objective law. Her next graphic adds literally nothing to her argument and is yet another example of her patchwork approach to argumentation. So if we go to the GLOBE study and we just cite a mention of something that they said, the authors, they said, and this is a study again of thousands, tens of thousands of people across 60 different countries on the planet. And they said, because in Judaism, Christianity and Islam, God is associated with ultimate goodness. Orders from God include specific duties and prohibitions that are associated with goodness and humanitarian behaviors. Some of the laws of God require humane oriented behaviors and doing good to others like almsgiving. This gives us a description of beliefs from the Abrahamic religions, but that no way implies the beliefs themselves are true. And some of those listed, such as refraining from sensual enjoyment, are far from universal. She now makes a very odd transition to William Lane Craig's argument for God from morality. So the ontological moral argument for God, and I'm borrowing some of this from what William Lane Craig, who's a pretty famous philosopher and debater. He said, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Two, objective moral values, which are descriptive, and duties, which are prescriptive, do exist. Three, therefore, it follows that God exists. This is a clear example of SJ's inability to understand what a rational argument is. Astonishingly, she forgot what it was she was supposed to prove, which is that objective morality exists and is grounded in God. Instead, she provides William Lane Craig's hackneyed argument for God's existence, an entirely different question. This is another example of her patchwork approach of just throwing anything in she finds that refers to morality. I really should just skip this entirely as irrelevant to the topic, but please indulge me a moment while I spend uh, a minute or two on William Lane Craig and this particular fallacy. 
William Lane Craig is one of the most intellectually dishonest people I've ever encountered. He knowingly spouts fallacies and falsehoods, not in search of truth, but to defend his indefensible religion. Unlike most apologists who are entirely ignorant of any philosophy later than medieval scholastic metaphysics, Craig actually knows better. In the question and answer section of the video, a viewer rightfully pointed out to SJ that Craig isn't a philosopher, he's an apologist. Her answer reveals the ignorance that Craig relies on in his followers. Her reply, he has two PhDs in philosophy. First of all, he has one PhD in philosophy, one PhD in theology. Second, a PhD in philosophy bestows the credential of scholar, not philosopher. Her claim would be the same as saying a P someone with a PhD in English is a poet or a novelist. There are some PhDs who are philosophers and there are some philosophers who don't have PhDs, but PhD never certifies someone as a philosopher. Second, Craig's intention is directly opposite of that of a philosopher. True philosophers search for new ways to understand truth, wherever that path leads. Apologists use every rhetorical trick at their command to argue for Christianity, no matter how much truth contradicts their narrative. As for his argument for morality, I'm sure it is obvious to anyone other than apologists that it is clearly fallacious. We need not accept the first premise that a God is necessary for objective morality to exist any more than we need to accept the premise that God is necessary for gravity to exist. More important, however, is the fault in the second premise. We have no evidence at all that objective morality and duties exist. That was what SJ was supposed to demonstrate. We do have supporting evidence for the theory that morality is a result of evolution, this absurd argument for morality proves nothing at all other than the gullibility of theists and the dishonesty of grifters like William Lane Craig. SJ next moves to a discussion of the Euthyphro dilemma, perhaps to in introduce the notion of morality as grounded in an essence or nature, but she muddles the whole discussion in a way that makes it impossible to be sure. The idea of morality grounded in essence or nature is a critically important ontological consideration, although she, remi she remains blithely unaware of its consequences. So now we're going to look at the Euthyphro dilemma. This is uh, one of the arguments, actually, that some people have tried to wage against this idea that the grounding of our morality is in God. And so I'm going to tell a little story and then do an analogy using this dilemma that I think should help people to come to understand what we're getting at here. So Socrates and Plato once discovered what they determined to be a dilemma, which some have used to try to crack holes in God as the grounding of our objective morality. They wondered whether something is loved by the gods because he is pious or whether it is because he is pious that he is loved by the gods. This dilemma has been subject to a variety of variations to posits God's relationship to our morality. Philosopher William Lane Craig has suggested that this is a false dilemma and a third option or horn should be present, which is that God is the source of the good. In other words, our objective morality is not grounded in what may be perceived as the whims of God made either before or after our actions. His very nature is the standard of goodness against which we judge, and uh, judge actions and align ourselves. In the Platonic dialogue, Euthyphro, Socrates asks Euthyphro, is the pious loved by the gods because it is pious, or is it pious because it is loved by the gods? This leads to a dilemma because if the gods love it because it is pious, then there is some objective moral law outside the gods, leaving us with no understanding of the grounding of morality. If it is pious because it is loved by the gods and the gods disagree what is pious, the morality is arbitrary and we are left in the dark about its nature. In contrast to SJ's incoherence, William Lane Craig actually does present a clear picture of this dilemma, so I'll quote him. 
I think it is clearly a false dilemma because the alternatives are not of the form A or not A, which would be an inescapable dilemma. The alternatives are like A or B. In that case, you can always add a third one, C, and escape the horns of the dilemma. I think in this case, there is a third alternative, which is to say, God wills something because he is good. That is to say, God himself is the paradigm of goodness, and his will reflects his character. God is by nature loving, kind, fair, impartial, generous, and so forth. Therefore, he could not have willed that, for example, hatred be good. This would be, contra this would be to contradict his very own nature. Craig makes the case that morality is not arbitrary, nor does it exist as an external law, but rather is a part of the nature of God. Now, Craig would never be honest enough to concede his argument of morality as a matter of essence is different from an objective law, but this is the important and probably true consequence of his argument. His third way is the essence of something primordial, whereas S.J. naively concedes, Goodness arises out of nature or essence as resolution. This notion of grounding in essence or nature is critical and we need to keep it in mind throughout. Both SJ and Craig, however, fail to address the nature and grounding of evil by limiting the essence of God solely to what we consider good. But of course, if there is one primordial essence it would contain everything that is revealed in the physical world. Even the primitive scribes of the Old Testament understood that, as revealed in Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, Yahweh, do all these things. The important question now is, essence or nature of what? Certainly, it can't be the Christian interpretation of the God of the Bible that grounds morality. A jealous God who exhorts his tribe to acts of enslavement and genocide and commands barbaric punishments for simply not believing in him, committing adultery, or being a disobedient boy. Apologists offer all sorts of dishonest claims that this barbarity was excusable or simply a misinterpretation of the Bible, and we will look at several examples from S.J., but it is inescapable that morality changes over time, even within the Bible. If barbaric retribution, such as an eye for an eye, taken directly from the Code of Hammurabi, is valid in one period, and turning the cheek in forgiveness is valid in the next, morality has changed. That defeats the notion of immutability, which disproves objective morality. We see even greater evolution of morality during the Enlightenment. If we now realize slavery is wrong, why did Yahweh condone it and Jesus command slaves to honor and obey their masters? As Jay later suggests, cultural reasons for the necessity of slavery 3,000 years ago, but this would imply cultural relativity and not an immutable law. She went on to claim that God saw that culture is not ready to end slavery, but somehow he was able to command obeisance to the Sabbath and, for, and forbid engraved images. It is truly a mystery that he could have chosen to admit the proscription of slavery as less important. By all appearances, the sense of morality is rather refined over the, over the millennia through culture and therefore not objective or immutable. So if not the biblical God, what does ground our morality? That is the present question of our age. More on that later. S.J. then transitions to a pointless and incoherent football analogy where she posits that one of the goalposts is God's goodness and the other is evil. I'll omit the clip of that presentation because it is, it is lengthy and rambling, but adds nothing of substance. I do recommend that you all go to the actual debate, to which I have provided a link below, to see everything in context. She claims God's nature forms the goalpost of goodness towards which we all strive, 
but is silent about what grounds the goalpost of evil, repeating the evasion of the totality expressed in Isaiah. This evasion is repeated in failing to include that we also strive for the opposite goalpost, rendering the football analogy fatally flawed. Although in her opening she stated her argument centered on the analogical question of morality, her patchwork approach for some reason steers her back into epistemology with the introduction of Aquinas' notion of synderesis. Now how do we know this? In Summa Theologia, Thomas Aquinas referred to synderesis as the law of our mind, which is an awareness or understanding of the principles of human actions. Practical reasoning moves one from awareness of the principles to conclusions on actions or decisions. Conscience then forms a judgment on whether the actions or decisions are in alignment with one's moral nature, whether they are right or wrong. The claim is that there is moral law within us from which we reason application to particular cases in the world. The conscience then pronounces judgment on the decision. The problem is that there was never a compelling case that there is a moral law, or even that we reason toward moral judgment. Her failure to establish the ontological issue makes her epistemological assertion irrelevant. It seems to me far more apparent that there is a moral sense that guides us directionally in our interpretation of choices in the world, and that conscience is a part of that moral sensibility. Next, she transitions to another hodgepodge of quotes. So I go to the points with C.S. Lewis, who came to from atheism, actually, to Christianity, based on these thoughts. He said, my argument against God was that a universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I gotten this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call something crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. In other words, where did this idea of how things are supposed to be originate? We witness this at the individual level in our conscience and at the global, societal, and historical levels in our collective drive over centuries to goodness. Quite so, but one need not posit a God to explain conscience or societal mor moral progress over time. And it once again fails to account for aggression, hatred, etc., for which we also have innate essential drives. Yet she claims, this necessarily cannot be explained at the level of human psychology because humans are prone to evil, the other goalpost, yet our conscience drives us to goodness. This necessarily cannot be explained at the level of human psychology, which was Richard Carrier's argument in a debate I had with him a couple of years back, because humans are prone to evil, to the other goalpost, yet our conscience drives us to goodness. That our conscience drives us to goodness can be explained as a means toward beneficial adaptation of cooperation and civilization rather than conflict and exists to tame the aggression, avarice, and hatred that always had been a part of our nature. Evolutionary psychology provides explanation for both goalposts as essence of our own being, correcting the Christian deficiency of failing to explain a ground for evil. As Greg Kukul has said, the problem of evil is only a problem if evil is real. To say something evil, though, is to make a moral judgment. Moral judgments require a moral standard or a moral law, and a moral law requires an author. If the standard is transcendent, that the lawgiver must be too. This merely repeats the fallacy of Craig's argument in that a moral judgment does not require a moral law. A moral, a moral standard is really more like a judgment of beauty guided by innate sensibility that can be refined over time, but not amenable to a code. This renders the notion of lawgiver moot. And then Richard Taylor, which Greg Kugel quoted, says a duty is something that is owed but something can be owed only to some person or persons. There can be no such thing as a duty in isolation. The concept of moral obligation is intelligible apart from the idea of God. The words remain, but their meaning is gone. I assume she has mistranscribed, and it should read that the concept of moral obligation is unintelligible without God. As I've demonstrated, this isn't necessarily true, and even if it were, 
that does not eliminate the possibility that moral obligation is indeed just empty words. What one wishes to be the case does not actually determine what is the case. And here she concludes. So to conclude, my opponent and I agree that we both have objective moral values and duties. We're both moral realists. At issue now is the source of the grounding. I have demonstrated that God's very nature grounds our morality. My opponent will have to argue, offer arguments either to refute my position or to offer another explanation. That her opponent and she agree on the existence of objective morals is irrelevant to the question itself. But more importantly, she has not demonstrated anything at all other than perhaps her incompetence in addressing philosophical issues. She, is presenting nothing, she has presented nothing more than empty claims and an invalid off-topic syllogism. More importantly, she unwittingly raises the more fundamental question of what it means to ground morality at all. Let's start with a, a reference she makes to Nietzsche. The reasons why Friedrich Nietzsche said it'd be so scary if we had a world without any sort of an external appeal beyond the level of the government leader. And he predicted, or portended, if you will, portended what would happen in the last century with the slaughter of 120 million people. If nothing else, this demonstrates the inadvisability of quoting from something you've never read. She could not possibly have trivialized or missed the point more. She's apparently referring to Nietzsche's madman announcing the death of God, which appears in Thus Spake Zarathustra and in Aphorism 125 of The Gay Science. It concerns the paramount event of the destruction of all metaphysics, which began in the Enlightenment. Through the character of the madman, Nietzsche describes how with the destruction of metaphysics, the notion of God vanishes, leaving the world in extreme vertigo as we struggle uprooted from the presumption of good and evil that oriented our world to construct new values on something more solid than the ephemeral metaphysical conjectures and inventions. We persist in this vertigo today. Martin Heidegger was once asked why he had not, never written anything on morality, to which he replied, we don't yet even know the right questions to ask, which finally compels us to address the question of grounding and essence. Both S.J. and Craig grounded morality in essence, but of an imaginary metaphysical nature for which we have no reason to credit existence, and which excludes the darker sides of reality. We would probably be more advanced in our thinking of morality had the Christian concept, concept of essence never occurred and we had in mind Yahweh as the essence of all existence, good and evil. For post-metaphysical place and time, we would need only to exchange the field of inquiry from the metaphysical to the physical as an inquiry into being itself as revealed in our own natures and the world we inhabit. If there is one thing we inquire into with no doubt about its existence, it is our own nature. And from what else could we become conscious of morality? We are a complicated manifold, and from our nature, we have evolved our consciousness and morality across a perceivable arc. As do all mammals, we have an innate sense of empathy, fairness, and care. At a point in our evolution, this trait became dominant as cooperation and civilization proved to be an extremely beneficial adaptation. This provides an objective physical explanation, if somewhat superficial, of the evolution of our morality, an arc traveling from aggression and, and barbarity to ever increasing of recognition of the worth of individuals, tolerance, and liberty. If we went no further in our analysis, this would still reveal what we consider the good to be outgrowths of our own innate natures. We are those mammals who aspire to the aspects of their own elements of nature that cause us to feel empathy, justice, and respect. These exist simultaneously with the previously evolved emotions of aggression, hatred, revenge, etc., but moderate them toward an apparent intention. 
This resolves the Christian deficiency of excluding all but the good in God's essence and provides the needed perspective to understand the roots of morality. What we consider good is grounded in our own essence and we could do no other. A much deeper question now beckons, however, the one Heidegger said we as yet not know how to ask, where did our nature come from? The question is, is vital to escaping the Nietzschean vertigo that still afflicts us and centers doggedly on the relation of our essence to the essence of being in its entirety. What is there in the nature of being itself that impels us toward the apparent goal of moral progress in contemplation of the universe? DNA can describe the mechanism toward this process, but who really has plummeted the mystery of DNA itself? The old gods have died and we are forced to start again from the beginning. Our advantage and starting point, however, is the realization that the revelations to these mysteries are to be found in being itself as the essence of the physical world. The metaphysical was an imaginary reality which could never serve as grounding. The physical world will reveal being when we learn to approach it, which is to say, let it speak to us rather than inventing laws. That means abandoning preconceived narratives and systems and embracing the profound manifold of being itself. Or as Bob Dylan once wrote, good and bad, I define these terms quite clear, no doubt somehow, uh, but I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. No, S.J., Nietzsche wasn't scared. The madman was. Nietzsche taught us to dance. <laughs>